professor. I teach at Harvard University, uh, in graduate school, uh, I became the student of John Fairbank, who brought me into the China field, and I ended up being effectively his last doctoral student. China had had historically one of the greatest market economies in the world, and it has developed another one yet again uh, since the early 1980s. So I always tell my students that hundreds of millions of Chinese lifted themselves out of poverty once they were given the chance. Well, in many ways, what the government did very wisely in the 1980s was to experiment with different forms of commerce. But in the 1980s, what we have seen in the 1980s is an enormous catch-up of where China would have been without the first 30 years uh, of the policies of the People's Republic, because Deng Xiaoping believed in experimentation. He believed in results more than ideology. Uh, and he believed that the people could be trusted to create wealth if you give them a chance to do so. He believed, of course, in socialism as the ultimate end, but there are different means to that end. Socialism, he believed, did not mean you had to be poor. Well, you know, Sun, Sun Dongshan, Sun Yat-sen, uh, he wrote many very influential works. If you go to Sun Yat-sen's house in Shanghai, in the French concession, you can see his outline of a map of the Chinese railway network. And you can put on top of it an outline of today's railway network. And you'd be remarkable, you'd, you would remark how similar these two plans are. But that has changed today, and building of roads, building of infrastructure uh, is an enormously positive development uh, for uh, the enrichment of the Chinese people. You know, a train from Boston to New York takes today about four hours. It's about 220 miles. The same distance is the distance between Shanghai and Nanjing, and by high-speed rail, by Chinese Gaotia, it takes one hour and two minutes. That is the future uh, that China has grasped more directly than many other countries. Certainly it would be wonderful if in every country people all worked together for the common good, uh, and certainly that is the aspiration of President Xi and his in his uh, vision for the Chinese dream. President Xi is obviously a very powerful leader. Uh, he has uh, succeeded in many different jobs uh, before uh, coming to be president of the country. He has clearly shown himself to be an extraordinarily effective leader in the Chinese political system. An old strength and a new strength. No country historically cares more about education than China. Today, uh, China is building what, in my view, will become, certainly can become, the greatest university system in the world. I think the future of China is extremely bright. Uh, you have particularly the future of the Chinese economy. China also has a world of Chinese outside of China uh, who go abroad, who study abroad, who get education around the world, and then in many, many cases, the majority come back to China and invest their knowledge, expertise, and sometimes capital back in China. The Germans, famously in the 19th century, the Americans, without question, by the end of the 20th century, in a leadership uh, position, uh, and perhaps China now poised to take on leadership in the 21st uh, century. I think this realm here today now as the People's Republic of China has the opportunity once again to be a global leader. I don't think any one country can be the global leader. Okay. China's rise over the last 40 plus years has been in partnership with others. It has been by attracting foreign investment. And now it is in part by investing abroad itself. Without foreign trade, without interaction with the rest of the world, we would not see the prosperous China that we see today. So China can lead without question, but I don't believe it can lead alone.